Okay. Next speaker is Carl Deiseroth. He's associate professor at Stanford. Uh, Carl took his BA at Harvard, then moved to Stanford and never left. And so he took a PhD and an MD at Stanford and now he's professor. Uh, Carl is one of these rare examples that uh, we will all la would like to be and uh, don't ask him how old he is but we didn't have enough room to put all the prizes that he won in the in the bio for example and I heard some time ago someone congratulated him for the Nobel Prize they will get so well, we'll see but we'll see why his work is so important for the neuroscience for the neuroscience community at this point well, thank you uh, for the invitation. Does, does that sound okay? Everybody can hear? Okay. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some of our work uh, to this community. A very fascinating uh, day of, of lectures, particularly on, uh, on uh, uh, imaging and uh, primates. And um, uh, there are aspects in which some of our work may help uh, uh, synergize with some of that uh, 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 literature. But also, quite separately, uh, there are uh, opportunities for understanding uh, not just systems neuroscience, but questions of disease, uh, particularly uh, psychiatric and neurological disease. I'm a psychiatrist. I see patients uh, who have uh, depression and also autism spectrum disease. And the progress has been very slow in these uh, realms. Uh, we have uh, very poor tools in psychiatry and neurology, both for uh, treatment and even for understanding, for interrogating uh, neural systems with the required spatial and temporal precision. So we have a long way to go. Uh, optogenetics is something that uh, may uh, help with aspects of that. This uh, slide helps uh, frame the magnitude of the challenge. What I've shown here are the symptoms of uh, schizophrenia which are uh, debilitating symptoms. They are devastating for the patient, for the family, for society. They're often fatal. They can lead to suicide. They're certainly uh, um, uh, also at the same time clinically hard to quantify and hard to measure. There are no uh, uh, lab tests, uh, really no imaging tests that will work on the level of an individual. Uh, there are a few uh, uh, microanatomical features that are interesting though. And if you look uh, what's shown here, are uh, the red dots are parvalbumin or fast spiking neurons and uh, let me see if I have a pointer here I think there's not a pointer but, uh, the uh, fast spiking cells are shown here in red I hope you can pick them out these are present at reduced levels in schizophrenia which is one of the few reproducible microanatomical findings the key question is how do we cross scales, oh, thank you, um, and understand how something like this could contribute uh, to this uh, class of symptoms. So obviously we'd like to be able to control the cells, turn them on or off uh, at will, uh, matching the temporal precision needed uh, that, uh, 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 that they're expected to operate on in the context of the normal uh, uh, behavior of the circuit. And uh, the way we have chosen to address this sort of challenge is through something we call optogenetics. This is combining genetics and optics to achieve gain or loss of function, just as a geneticist would, but not of genes, instead of well-defined events like action potentials uh, or what specified trains of action potentials or patterns within specific cells of living tissue, even within uh, freely uh, behaving uh, mammals. The approach that we've taken uh, involves uh, a single component uh, uh, elements that encompass light sensation and effector function all within a single gene, a single open reading frame. Uh, some examples are shown here. These are uh, tools that we've taken from various aspects of microbial biology. Uh, for example, this blue light activated cation channel comes from a single cell of green alga called chlamydomonas. What we found back in 2004 and 2005 is we could put this gene into uh, a neurons here in culture, three separate neurons that are then receiving the same defined blue uh, light pulse pattern and you see almost exactly the same spike train coming out. So so this is gain of function uh, of the neural code. Uh, it's uh, not 100% perfect with this first implementation. You can see, uh, maybe you can see there's a doublet of spikes at the end here that this neuron and this neuron fails to uh, hit that last spike in the train. Uh, I'll show you ways that we can improve the fidelity with molecular engineering uh, of these tools. Uh, at the same time, although there were uh, some problems with the first uh, uh, implementations. There were also uh, some things that we were uh, fortunate uh, to observe. One was how fast the tools were. You could drive spiking with uh, uh, standard, deviation of, standard deviation of spike timing on the order of one millisecond. So uh, highly precise spiking. 
Um, this is illustrated here. We, you can put channel rhodopsin 2 into a lentivirus, introduce that into the hippocampus of an adult mouse, and here in an acute slice, whole cell patch clamp recording, we can drive spikes at different frequencies. And here are five superimposed sweeps driving uh, a neuron at 50 hertz. And you can see uh, until you start to have some failures toward the end of the train, which I will uh, show you how you can overcome this problem, uh, it looks like just a single sweep early on on the train. And this is pointing to the uh, temporal precision of the method even within this intact tissue. Uh, also well tolerated, in fact, we can even make uh, uh, behaving uh, uh, and, and breeding and, and healthy colonies of mice that express channel rhodopsin 2 throughout the brain here using the thigh one promoter showing expression throughout layer 5 of cortex. And uh, you don't need to add any chemicals or drugs. There are native retinoids, which are, happen to be the chromophore for, for the uh, microbial opsins that are already present in all vertebrate tissues that we've looked at. Now, uh, uh, I will touch on some aspects of, of development after those initial uh, uh, observations in cultured neurons. A lot of work was required to make it versatile and, and generalizable. Uh, we've expanded the, the toolkit uh, with different colors of light, different kinds of effector function. We've done a lot of molecular engineering, uh, which is quite interesting from the biophysics standpoint, improving the speed, sensitivity, reliability, and other features. Uh, readouts, which might be of most interest uh, to this group, and I'll spend a fair bit of time on that, uh, making readouts that are compatible with, with fiber optics and targeting and applications are also of great interest and I'll, I'll touch on some aspects there too. I'll go very quickly through some older uh, published work and try to spend most of my time on, on very recent uh, published and unpublished work um, uh, from this year. So this is the big challenge we face in large-brained organisms, which is the, uh, the volume of tissue recruited by light. If you focus on this panel, this is the drop-off of light power density or irradiance as a function of depth in tissue. At one millimeter, you're at less than 1% of your initial light power density. And this is due to scattering and, and absorption. Uh, Red-shifted light will penetrate a little more deeply. Uh, this is about the irradiance value that you need to drive spiking in a typical neuron expressing a, a moderate level of, of a, a channel rhodopsin. Uh, but you can see not a big effect still. So we have to get light deep, and we do that with uh, fiber optics. This turns out to be a very easy to use method uh, and uh, very cheap, lightweight, and flexible. The animals can move freely with a fiber optic. Here's a very short, simple movie just showing you to illustrate the freely moving nature of the animal. This is an animal with uh, fiber optic implanted in right anterior motor cortex. When the light goes on, it starts circling left. So it's got a fiber implanted, but you can see it doesn't impair its movement at all. We turn off the light here. It stops. There's a little commutator that lets the fiber rotate so it doesn't break. And, and so now, in this case, we happen to be driving layer 5 of M2 um, motor cortex at 20 hertz, uh, and we saw this behavioral result. Now, a lot to understand about exactly how that happens, which we don't fully understand. The point here being just that uh, the animal can move freely with the fiber in place. And in some older work, we uh, were able to target the lateral hypothalamic uh, hypocretin or orexin neurons uh, in freely moving mice uh, using a hypocretin promoter to target these neurons that had been linked to narcolepsy with uh, genetic information in both humans and other animals and map out some of the neural codes associated with awakening. Uh, an illustration of that is shown just uh, as an example here. If you focus on these two traces here, this is a sleeping, slow wave sleep mouse. It gets 20 hertz stimulation to the hypocretin neurons and then after a brief delay the animal awakens, the EG changes, the EMG shows movement. And you can see this not in the control case. Uh, and we were able to map out some of the spike dependence. We found that no fewer than, no, no more than 50 spikes were needed in order to drive this uh, in this population of defined hypocretin neurons in vivo. Now, that's uh, one kind of readout as a behavioral readout. Uh, what other kinds of readouts would be useful? We'd actually like to get deeper into the circuit and. Uh, uh, get readouts of, uh, of performance of the players within the circuit, uh, ideally uh, in a setting of simultaneous optogenetic control. Now you could do this by imaging um, and do an all optical experiment. This is the action spectrum of channel rhodopsin 2 and you can use a calcium sensitive dye on one end or a voltage sensitive dye on the other and get an optical readout of activity as well. And we've shown you can actually do this. This is a voltage sensitive dye a set of recordings, 5 hertz or 20 hertz. Uh, driving a defined cell population in a hippocampal slice. And you can see quantitatively tractable different responses measured by the voltage sensitive dye coming out. Now this works, uh, but I really think the most exciting thing is uh, the interaction of optogenetics with other kinds of readouts, in particular uh, electrical and uh, MRI. 
Here, uh, she, this is illustrating the key advantage. This is a fusion of a fiber optic and a recording electrode. And this is our first generation version. We call this an optrode. And you can actually record from the tissue as you stimulate because the, you can set things up so there's no optical artifact when you uh, stimulate. And so here, uh, a blown up trace, you can see no electrical artifact at the onset or offset of the light pulse. You're actually able to see what the circuit is doing as you uh, record. And this is something that has uh, confounded, for example, the study of deep brain stimulation where when you deliver a high frequency pattern of stimulation you have an enormous uh, artifact problem. You can't see what's happening in the circuit. Are the neurons being more active, less active, synchronized, desynchronized, etc. So that uh, was the first generation. Now I want to share some unpublished work on the second generation. This is what we call an optetrode. It's uh, actually uh, capitalizes. It turns out that the fiber optic is a beautiful structural element for uh, a multi-electrode uh, 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 set of elements. And you can actually attach four uh, separate tetrodes. So you have a total of 16 channels around a uh, fiber optic and use that uh, based on a tetrode-like drive to advance that into the brain and achieve very stable recordings over months in intact, uh, freely moving uh, mice. The whole thing weighs less than two grams, uh, so an animal, a mouse can bear it freely on its head and, 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 uh, and as I'll show you in the next slide, uh, uh, move freely. Uh, and this uh, footprint is actually much smaller than that that you would have with a typical 16 uh, channel uh, tetrode by other means. So the, this is actually, uh, uh, it's, you know, for example, in frontal cortex, here in medial prefrontal cortex of a mouse, it's, it's classically hard to get um, well-resolved uh, units. And here an animal that's uh, freely moving in this uh, uh, open field apparatus, you can see the path tracing there. We're able to pick out a number of different well-resolved uh, units with the tetrodes. And this is uh, now allowing us to have uh, multi-channel electrical readouts while we do optical control on a freely moving animal. So this is a, a, another kind of readout. Um, fMRI is another very interesting kind of readout. And so you've heard a lot of beautiful talks already today. Uh, one question that interests me uh, about uh, fMRI is as a psychiatrist, I'd like to know, are there populations of cells that are not able to uh, recruit the same global pattern of activity in a disease state compared to the, the control state. Uh, for example, let's say uh, dopaminergic neurons, are they unable to, to recruit the same pattern associated with uh, reward or hedonic responses uh, in the depressed-like state versus the, the healthy state? And these are fascinating questions, but uh, uh, very hard to do unless you have a way of selectively driving the dopamine neurons uh, optically while doing uh, a, a global uh, uh, imaging uh, modality. And so we explored the, the fusion of optogenetics and fMRI. We call this OFMRI. And this actually uh, works. You can, as shown here, uh, you can actually take an adult rat. Uh, you can uh, transduce cells in motor cortex with uh, channel rhodopsin 2 here under the control of a chem kinase 2 alpha promoter. This governs expression in excitatory cells within the cortex. And you can make everything MR compatible, introduce the fiber, and uh, the, the pattern we chose actually was 20 hertz, and I was quite fascinated to see uh, 20 hertz uh, sort of lying on an interesting point on the uh, graph that you saw in a, a presentation earlier, where above 20 hertz you tend to see uh, interesting uh, uh, positive correlations with uh, uh, the bold signal, and below that perhaps uh, an anti-correlation. And so interestingly, 20 hertz is right on that uh, cusp, and so it would be interesting to map that out in more detail. In any case, driving at 20 hertz, uh, just focus on these two uh, images. This is a control animal that received light in the scanner, but no uh, opsin had been delivered, and we saw no uh, 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 bold type signal. Here, an animal that had received the opsin, you can see a nice uh, bold signal. And here's the uh, uh, hemodynamic response function that we observed. You can see a little scale bar here at 10 seconds. And we were intrigued that uh, uh, a number of the kinetic uh, properties of this, as the folks in the audience will readily recognize, seem to match or be quite uh, correspond well to those that you would observe even in human beings in response to sensory stimulation uh, with a three to six second delay for onset, uh, 20 uh, or seconds or so of decay after stimulus uh, conclusion and under undershoot and uh, recovery. And so this was interesting that you could recapitulate all these complex dynamics with uh, uh, nothing more than coordinated drive of the local uh, excitatory uh, neurons and whatever is, is downstream then of, of those neurons. And so this was an interesting finding. And, and uh, we and David Leopold both pointed out that this was uh, potentially of interest in capitalizing on this property of, of, of trying to understand what might be downstream of these neurons to actually image and obtain global maps of activity in healthy or diseased uh, states. 
and but I haven't shown you anything about a global map yet. All I've shown you is uh, bold responses locally at the site of stimulation. So here then is the challenge: Can you uh, uh, stimulate and uh, in, a, in a particular site, for example, cortex, and can you find responses downstream? Can you even do a more interesting experiment, which is to uh, recruit a cell population defined not only by where its cell bodies are, but by virtue of where it projects to. And you can do this because the microbial opsins, if you set things up right and if you modify them uh, molecularly, will traffic very well down axons. And so you can make axons photosensitive. You can introduce a fiber. You can drive spikes in these cells and recruit this population of cell by virtue of its uh, connectivity. So if this were possible, uh, that would be quite interesting as well. And so now I'll show you a couple images, uh, uh, slides uh, exploring that. Uh, at Stanford, all we have is a 7T small animal magnet, actually quite weak, uh, but uh, it was what we had, so we used it. I think it's reassuring that, uh, uh, that you can see these, these signals at all, and I think people with stronger uh, magnets will be able to see better uh, signals. Uh, we found that you could indeed, still while driving in cortex, see nice signals, for example, downstream in ipsilateral uh, thalamus. Uh, and you could do the experiment that I mentioned earlier. You can come and deliver light uh, downstream to thalamus. And even though you actually delivered the virus, carrying the microbial opsin elsewhere, if you do histology, you can see nice expression in motor cortex. But if you look down in thalamus, you can see the light, uh, putatively light-sensitive axons expressing channel rhodopsin 2 fused to a yellow fluorescent protein. And indeed, this works. Here is the thalamic uh, region, and here is the motor cortex region. And you can see a local bold response both uh, uh, in the thalamus and then uh, back uh, upstream in the ipsilateral motor cortex. Now, uh, of course, a number of caveats about this. Uh, certainly one uh, issue which you're all familiar with is that the absence of a signal doesn't imply a lack of uh, connectivity or important connectivity. Uh, but where a signal is, that's uh, certainly of interest. And uh, the signals we find are quite reproducible and tractable from animal to animal, case to case. And this is something that may provide the, the foundation for achieving these global maps of the causal effect of a defined cell population, uh, both in uh, the healthy state and in the disease state. So that's another kind of readout. We talked about fast optical voltage sensitive dyes, uh, multi unit recording with optetrodes, uh, and then uh, fMRI. Now, you, as you're all looking at this, you're thinking, well, it would be great to make this uh, more complex, too. It would be great to drive different populations um, of projections from one region to another, see how they uh, synergize, maybe how they gate or antagonize each other, what kinds of computations happen. When, if you could drive two different populations independently or inhibit one population while driving another. And so the rest of the talk, then, will be uh, our efforts to kind of build up that sort of repertoire as well. And as I go forward, you can imagine how you can apply this sort of thing to uh, for example, an OFMRI experiment. The first thing I'll touch on is uh, briefly is to give you a flavor of how the molecular engineering can happen, and then I'll talk about expanding the toolkit to give you multi-channel control of both excitation and inhibition. So here are some of the problems that you can encounter. Uh, this is uh, a cell that's expressing high levels of channel rhodopsin 2, and you can see some uh, artifactual uh, uh, challenges that we face. Sometimes in response to a, a single blue light pulse, you get doublets of spikes out, or even triplets or, or quadruplets instead of a single spike. Uh, note the time scale here, 50 milliseconds. Now, channel rhodopsin 2 is fast, but not quite uh, fast enough for a fast spiking cell. This prolonged uh, depolarization may contribute to the doublet, and also in uh, a pattern of repetitive light delivery may lead to an accumulating uh, plateau-like potential that could cause a number of problems. It may have its own information processing significance, and it may impair the elicitation of spikes later in the train, as shown here, most likely through impaired de-inactivation of the voltage-gated sodium channels. And so we've got three problems here. And all of these, uh, we hypothesize, could be addressed if we could somehow speed up the deactivation of channel rhodopsin 2 after a light off. And here we were able to build on uh, uh, really decades of work studying bacterial rhodopsin. So in 1971, the first single component microbial transmembrane, the regulator of transmembrane ion conductance, bacterial rhodopsin, was discovered by Stokinius and Osterheld at UCSF. And uh, 
that triggered thousands of papers over the ensuing decades uh, studying its structure, its function, its, uh, 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 the crystal structure is known. Although we don't have a crystal structure for channel rhodopsin, there's substantial homology. And so we can hypothesize which residues around the all trans retinal uh, may be important for governing kinetics building on the bacteria rhodopsin work. And this particular glutamate 123 uh, turns out to be something uh, we found that could speed things up quite substantially. And if you mutate that to a threonine or to an alanine, we call these mutants the cheetah mutants. They're fast mutants, and this is, stands for channel rhodopsin E123T or, or A, threonine or alanine. Uh, you see a resolution of many of these fidelity problems that, that, that we noticed. For example, you don't see these multiplets anymore. Uh, this post-spike depolarization is virtually gone. You actually recover little nice hyperpolar after hyperpolarizations. That plateau potential is gone, and a lot of these data are, are summarized here. And indeed, this also addresses the missed spike problem that you see late in trains. And now you can keep up with 200 hertz or even higher, uh, no problem with essentially perfect fidelity even within uh, intact tissue. So this was an interesting example of merging the uh, decades of work on bacteria and with uh, the strong desire to improve the fidelity of the tools. And uh, the, the, these uh, variants are actually uh, now very useful for cases where you need to be uh, uh, quite certain uh, what you're delivering to the cells. Now what about loss of function? This is a question that we initially addressed by exploring light-activated chloride pumps called halorhodopsins. These deliver chloride ions into cells in electrogenic fashion, so this could in principle lead to a hyperpolarization. These were discovered in 1977 by Matsuno Yagi and colleagues. And uh, crystal structure is known also for these. In fact, for the halobacterium salinarum halorhodopsin, a crystal structure was solved in 2000. Uh, this does generate currents if you put it into heterologous cells, but they run down quite quickly. Uh, but a more obscure one from Neutronomonas ferionis turned out to work quite well. Redshifted action spectrum as well as stable currents. And you can actually get a hyperpolarization in response to yellow light. I'm going quickly through this to get to the uh, new and unpublished work, uh, which I'll show you. You can actually co-express these in the same cells, the Neutronomonas ferionis halorhodopsin NPHR or the channelrhodopsin in the same cell. Drive spikes and blue light pulses and shut them off with yellow light. Uh, you can, early on, uh, we did this first in collaboration with Alexander Gottschalk in worms. You can partially paralyze a worm with yellow light expressed uh, with expression in the muscles or the cholinergic motor neurons. And uh, until some unpublished work, which I'll show you, it had not been yet achieved in freely moving mammals, but I'll get to that at the end of the talk, uh, sort of closing the loop from uh, worm to mammal. Now, here's the problem we had to resolve, though, before we could make that happen. It worked well in, in worm early on, but uh, we noticed uh, some subcellular problems that if we expressed this first generation version of the halorhodopsin, that there were these accumulations that appeared inside the cell. Now, it turns out the archaebacteria that make these halorhodopsins don't have what we would uh, call an endoplasmic reticulum, and so uh, we uh, explored whether there was buildup in the ER, and indeed there is if you co-stain with ER markers. And we were able to resolve that problem by then providing an ER export motif, which the archaebacterium would have no reason to put on uh, the uh, uh, protein. And that essentially resolved the problem. We borrowed this very short amino acid motif from a mammalian uh, inward rectifier potassium channel. And this actually works uh, quite well. So uh, here then is the, is the first uh, uh, primate uh, optogenetic inhibition. This is work done in collaboration with Krishna Shinoy, uh, unpublished work uh, in uh, motor cortex of the rhesus macaque, delivering this 2.0 version and getting uh, quite sharp, as you can see, uh, and, and reversible uh, inhibition of uh, firing of cells in motor cortex. Uh, our colleague Botan Roska has put this into uh, X vivo human uh, retina, so human neurons, but in uh, explanted uh, 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 tissue and can get hyperpolarization and response to green or yellow light in, in these human neurons as well. So this, is, this one works well, but we now have improved it even further and added additional trafficking motifs, in particular one that facilitates trafficking out into the, to the dendrites and axons. Remember how useful it was to achieve control of a cell by illuminating the axon. This depended on having the protein traffic well down into the axon. And so this uh, is something that if one could then achieve projection-specific inhibition, that would, of course, be of uh, great interest as well. 
And this led to this third generation halo rhodopsin. Just focus on this uh, row here. Here's the first generation one. You can see accumulations. Second generation, no accumulations in the ER, but not getting out into the processes too well. Third generation trafficking very well out into the processes. Uh, nanoamp scale photocurrents, and you can hyperpolarize cells by uh, more than 100 millivolts, so very potent. Uh, and the currents are quite uh, stable as well, a little bit of a peak in a stable, steady state. This turned out to be uh, generalizable, this trafficking principle. We went back to the very first microbial opsin, the 1971 bacteria opsin of Stachinius and Osterhelt, and we asked why didn't optogenetics start you know, back then in the 70s or as soon as molecular cloning became available in the late 70s and early 80s. And here's the reason, if you just put bacteria opsin into neurons, doesn't go to the membrane very well, and you don't see uh, good photocurrents. But we just added two motifs to it, the trafficking signal and the ER export motif, and this is the result. It goes to the membrane beautifully, and now you have a, a robust green light activated inhibitor that the particular eye on this flux is, leads to inhibition. And so you can, uh, uh, it turns out, and we apply this to a number of other genomically identified opsins as well. There's an enormous diversity of microbial opsins out there, thousands of them that have different uh, responses to various colors of light and achieve different kinds of effector function, various ion flow uh, properties. Uh, most of them don't express well. It looks like uh, uh, it's really a trafficking issue, and we think we can unlock uh, basically a, a, a large fraction of the diversity that's out there with this uh, um, trafficking approach. Now, you can also get red light inhibition, even though the peak of the action spectrum doesn't shift with the trafficking modifications, everything is scaled up, and so you can now use the shoulder of the action spectrum and you can get inhibition in the red, uh, deep red or far red, right up the infrared border, 680 nanometers. This is great, as you know, this is much more deeply penetrating light, uh, safer to use, scatters less, gives you higher resolution, and so now, uh, you can start to imagine, uh, think back to the fMRI experiments, uh, now bringing to bear both excitation and inhibition at the same time, testing not just gain of function but loss of function as well, and exploring uh, the contributions of cells to global patterns of activity. What about combinatorial excitation, though? I haven't really shown you that. I've shown you blue excitation and yellow or red inhibition. So I'm going to show you some unpublished data that leads to our ability to uh, achieve combinatorial excitation in vivo. Obviously, one thing that made green fluorescent protein so powerful was having red-shifted versions of it. This was essential to the combinatorial aspect of it. This allowed d determination if one cell expresses two different proteins. Do two proteins come near each other? Does one cell touch another? And a host of other uh, crucial fundamental issues like that. But having blue excitation and red-shifted inhibition is great for that purpose, but for a purpose, but doesn't quite address the issue of combinatorial excitation. We'd like to drive one projection alone or in combination with another projection to a brain region. We'd like to drive a cell population alone or in combination with an interneuron or a modulatory population and uh, come to an understanding of the causal role of, of multiple populations and giving rise to uh, circuit uh, dynamics or behavior. And so now I'll show you some data leading, culminating in the production of something called C1V1 that allows you to achieve that in vivo. Microbial opsins are present throughout all the major kingdoms of life uh, in enormous diversity. Uh, our genomics efforts beginning back in 2007, uh, no, thank you, led to the identification of uh, a, a gene from Volvox carteri uh, that we called VCHR1. Uh, we predicted it would be red shifted based on the uh, partial negative charges that we anticipated would be on either end of the all transretinal polyene. And here indeed is the red shifted action spectrum. There's overlap in the blue, but there's a completely pure band out in the amber where you can drive, in principle, this population alone without touching the CHR2 population. And then you could add in the CHR2 population, as we talked about, by adding in blue light. Uh, does it work though? So you, it expresses in neurons and you can drive action potentials in culture with amber light. This is a wavelength that doesn't touch CHR2 cells at any power density you deliver, so that's good. Unfortunately, as we showed in the first paper, the currents are quite small. For the physiologists in the room, uh, 100 picoamps is good, uh, works in culture. Uh, because of the scattering problem though, this is not enough uh, in vivo. Uh, you need typically about five fold uh, stronger currents for things to be robust in vivo, perhaps tenfold greater. And 
Uh, you can get a little bit of an improvement by turning up the light power density, but that doesn't give you quite enough. And in any case, that's generally inadvisable. Uh, this, it's better to stay in this uh, safe low to moderate light intensity range, uh, less than five milliwatts per square millimeter. So over the ensuing few years, uh, from 2007, 2008 until the present, uh, we've been engaging in a process of improving VCHR1. All of this is unpublished, but it's culminated in something we call C1V1. What's plotted here is the uh, photocurrents, one nanoamp, two nanoamps. Uh, I mean, these are enormous uh, if you get above one nanoamp. Uh, what's here is fluorescence intensity, so it, as you can see, readily appreciate most of our improvements have stemmed from improved uh, expression of the protein. If we add the trafficking sequence that I told you about, it helps a little bit. If you make a chimera between VCHR1 and CHR1, another opsin from chlamydomonas, not CHR2, but a poorly expressing opsin from, CHR, from chlamydomonas, so here we're making chimera between two poorly expressing opsins, it actually expresses better. Uh, you add the trafficking sequence to that, it's better. If you add the cheetah mutation that I told you about, it gets uh, better as well. If you combine everything, you've got this uh, C1V1. Uh, it's actually the most potent channel of opsin out there, and it has no CHR2 sequence at all, which is quite interesting. And this then uh, works quite well to drive spikes. Uh, here's what the chimera looks like, by the way. Two transmembrane helices from CHR1, the rest from VCHR1. And for the sake of time, just focus down here on this combination in vivo experiment. So what we have is uh, a parvalbumin or fast spiking GABAergic population to which we've delivered a conventional blue light activated channel rhodopsin. And we did this using a Cree-dependent adeno-associated viral vector expressing channel rhodopsin to inject it into the brain of a parvalbumin Cree driver mouse that only allows expression in parvalbumin or fast spike and GABAergic neurons. So inhibition is blue light driven. At the same time, we introduced C1V1 into the pyramidal cell population using the CAM kinase 2 alpha promoter that I've already told you about that governs expression in excitatory cells within cortex. So the pyramidal cells are going to be driven by red shifted light, green or yellow. We then had a combination optrode funneling a purple laser and a green laser in through a fiber splitter into an optrode that we then advanced down into a, a medial prefrontal cortex. And we then explored what happened. Now here we're driving the pyramidal cell population with green light, and then we add in the inhibitory population by adding in the purple light. Not much happens. The reason is that we've staggered the light pulses. So we've offset them a little bit so the GABAergic cell population's effect uh, is uh, apparently not no longer present by the time the green light is driving the pyramidal cell population. So here we're capitalizing on the temporal precision, of course, of the method and of the native uh, circuitry. As we narrow that window, though, as we bring the light pulses closer together, uh, we can then achieve uh, a state where we've then uh, inhibited the excitatory population by uh, driving precisely timed inhibition coming from the GABAergic population. And this is a plot of the drop off of that uh, effect as a function of narrowing the window uh, size. So this is then combinatorial excitation uh, within the brain of an intact mammal. Now, uh, a brief summary before we get to some uh, applications, and I'll, I'll wrap up uh, soon after that. The, uh, here's a summary of, of the opsins that I've, I've shared with you. These are the most potent ones, but as I mentioned, they're going to be uh, hundreds or thousands more. The trafficking concepts will certainly help in, in uh, leading to the translation of, of, of these new kinds of, of opsins to uh, uh, neurobiology. All of them share these key five properties. Single component, can't stress this enough, this is crucial for speed and reliability, ease of targeting, uh, uh, and a host of other properties. Uh, in fact, the fact that you don't need to add chemicals like, uh, uh, like the retinol is very important for achieving good control and behaving uh, mammals. The tools coming from biology, uh, although they need a little help to work well in, in mammals, we've, we've achieved that and then we uh, get to leverage the fact that they do come from biology. They use physiologically tol tolerable uh, intensities and wavelengths of light. So you don't have to do, for example, UV uh, high intensity uncaging. Uh, and that is very important for tolerability. 
Uh, they're fast, millisecond precision, no dark activity in here. We're capitalizing on millions of years of evolution of these beautiful uh, retinal-based uh, photoreceptors and tunable, as you've seen, uh, suitable for combinatorial control. Now, what about applications? So uh, I'll go through some older ones quickly and I'll, I'll try to get, on, uh, get uh, a little bit of time to, to cover uh, some unpublished work and work that's in press. We did uh, target the parvalbumin or fast spiking cells using a Cree-dependent adeno-associated viral vector injected into a parvalbumin Cree driver animal. And we were able to find that the fast spiking cells do favor the emergence of gamma oscillations, uh, which in turn enhanced aspects of information flow between other steps of cortical microcircuitry. And, and for me as a psychiatrist, this was fascinating because it pro pro provided a, a potential uh, link be between the causal role of these cells and some of the information processing problems that are seen in, in uh, schizophrenia. But I want to spend more time talking about reward and reinforcement. Um, a year or so ago, a year and a half ago, uh, we drove uh, the dopamine neurons in freely moving animals. We in, uh, injected into uh, a tyrosine hydroxylase Cree driver mouse a Cree-dependent adeno-associated viral vector that we designed. There's an inverted channel rhodopsin gene that only makes garbage unless it's uh, inverted by Cree. And then the strong promoter drives potent expression in the Th cells. Uh, if the virus is introduced into the VTA, that's going to be the dopamine cells. And the specificity is very strong. Uh, greater than 98% of the photosensitive cells are indeed dopamine uh, neurons. What's interesting is the expression looks strong. You can look in downstream accumbens and you can see the fibers arising from the VTA that are investing the local new end positive neurons. We showed that this was not only specific but potent enough. You could drive, for example, single spikes or bursts of spikes with blue light pulses. And we then applied this uh, using the fiber optic uh, or interface to a freely moving animal to see if we could uh, govern condition place preference. And this is a very simple behavioral test uh, widely used in studies of uh, addiction and reward uh, where an animal is exposed to a reward or aversive stimulus in one chamber and then the animal is later assayed to see if it prefers spending time in that chamber uh, or not. And uh, here, of course, the freely moving nature was crucial. You can see the animal can explore the chamber freely even with a fiber in place. What we found uh, here's one of those chambers now stood on end. Here's one chamber, here's the other chamber. Uh, and we did a number of different experiments pairing different patterns of uh, dopamine neuron drive against each other. For example, if we gave the same number of light pulses in a phasic burst versus a slow tonic pattern, later after training, the animal much preferred to spend time in the chamber where it had received the phasic high frequency burst, the dopamine neurons, even though the same number of light pulses had been delivered in, in both cases. Uh, I won't go through all the experiments for the sake of time, but a host of control experiments show that there was not a, a nonspecific effect on uh, anxiety, locomotion, or other behaviors, and this was not seen in control animals. A putative mechanism uh, was identified using fast scanning cyclic voltam voltammetry in downstream uh, accumbens. We found that the phasic stimulation generated uh, stronger dopamine transients in the accumbens uh, compared with the tonic, even with the same number of light pulses. Uh, this uh, uh, was interesting. Uh, of course, a caveat of all of this is that the animal is not uh, really working uh, for light. Uh, so with the condition place preference, it's not quite an operant uh, uh, behavior. The animal is simply expressing uh, a preference. And so a key question became is can you make an animal actually work uh, for uh, light pulses to the dopamine neurons? And this is unpublished data shown here. And we added an additional complexity to this. In instead of delivering the light to the VTA, we went ahead and delivered it to downstream uh, accumbens, even though we delivered the virus here, again capitalizing on this projection targeting concept, and then asking the question, are the dopamine neurons that are projecting to the accumbens, are, are they causally involved? Will an animal work for activity in those neurons? And here's a, a few examples uh, uh, of recent work. We have a nose poke assay where the animal uh, is, is a, a nose poke will trigger a phasic burst uh, of light pulses. And the animals never show uh, an emerging preference for the control nose poke hole, which does not deliver the, the blue light pulses, but uh, an emerging uh, preference to work very hard for the active nose poke that does deliver this. We don't see this in control animals. Uh, the animals remember it here. Uh, another cohort, day one, the animals uh, uh, discovering that the uh, active nose 
poke a, a hole is rewarding. And then day two, remembering that quite clearly and starting to do the active hole nose poke much more readily. So the animals will work for reward in this fashion, really showing a causal role for patterns of activity in these neurons, and indeed in neurons that execute this particular projection in driving reward-related behavior. So this is something that, that you could not have really done with other means. Um, at the same time, you might say, well, we all kind of thought dopamine neurons are involved in reward somehow, right? So uh, how, how surprising is this? Well, it is, it is nice to see, actually, there was a fair, there is and still is, you know, controversy in the field to the extent to which activity in dopamine neurons uh, actually constitutes a, a reward signal. Uh, but we went uh, further, and this is some work that's in press coming out in a couple weeks, uh, where we delved deeper into the processing within the accumbens and found some uh, quite interesting and surprising results. Here we explored the causal role of the cholinergic neurons within the accumbens in, in governing uh, uh, reward-related behavior. Now, these are very interesting cells. They're, uh, they constitute less than 1% of the population of cells within the accumbens. They're very rare, sparsely distributed. They have enormous arborizations, though. As far as it is known, they constitute the only source of cholinergic uh, uh, tone in the accumbens. But it's been controversial uh, what, what, what their, the causal role of these neurons is. You can add pharmacological inhibitors uh, to various receptors, uh, but that's led to controversy in the literature. Some groups reporting one result, some groups reporting another result. And in any case, the effect of modulating a receptor is a very different question than asking what the cells themselves do. Given the diversity of receptors, the fact that they can be expressed on inhibitory or excitatory cells, uh, a very different question is, what are these cells really doing? What is the causal role of these cells? So we delivered either this third generation halorhodopsin, not yet shown to work in mammalian cells until, until now uh, in vivo uh, in a freely moving animal, or channelrhodopsin. Uh, we found they worked well. You could get uh, very robust hyperpolarizations, more than 80 millivolts uh, with yellow light, or you could drive spikes with blue light. Starting in slice, we asked what happens if you record from the medium spiny neurons, which constitute the dominant local cell population, an inhibitory population, while optically driving the acetylcholine cells. These uh, were labeled. We had a chat Cree driver line and a Cree dependent adeno associated viral vector that we injected into those cells. The specificity was similar to the dopamine case, very high. And so we know we're driving the choline acetyltransferase or the cholinergic uh, cells. Driving them leads to uh, an increase in inhibitory events blocked by GABA receptor antagonists in the medium spiny neurons. So driving the cholinergic cells we found in a way you couldn't have done in any other way clearly elevates the uh, inhibitory tone within the circuit. And this was a reproducible finding. This is in a slice. What about in vivo? Here we use an optrode and we see a very similar thing. In most units, 80%. Uh, you see this uh, robust time-locked inhibition of uh, spiking. Uh, some, uh, a minority of sites show uh, an, ex an excitation. These could be uh, the cholinergic cells or they could be cells that are, de that are disinhibited uh, by virtue of the recurrent circuitry that are present within the accumbens. But clear the overall effect consistent with what we see in the slice. What if you do the converse experiment? Uh, now in vivo, still using an optrode, and indeed, inhibiting the cholinergic cells gives rise to uh, excitation of the circuitry. Again, a similar pattern, dominant uh, case. The dominant uh, uh, pattern seen is one of, uh, 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 of excitation. Here was one of the uh, exceptions, though. This is one of the cells that show uh, inhibition. You can see this very sharp, time-locked uh, inhibition. Interestingly, this cell had uh, slightly broader spikes than the other ones, and it's known that the cholinergic cells have broader spikes than the uh, medium spiny neurons, so this was probably uh, one of the cells that we were directly inhibiting, one of the uh, chat cells themselves. So uh, we then explored the cause role of these cells in cocaine conditioning. Uh, first question we asked is, what, what is the direct effect of cocaine on the cholinergic uh, cells? That was also unknown. Uh, we targeted them by virtue of their expression of the channelrhodopsin YFP fusion protein, and we found that cocaine, uh, here in a slice experiment, gave rise to uh, increased excitability of the neurons, gradually increased uh, spiking rate uh, as cocaine was uh, perfused. Uh, this is not a pattern seen. In fact, you typically see rundown when you just have control uh, ACSF. So then we asked, what happens if you inhibit this cocaine-induced spiking in a freely moving animal? Do you modulate the emergence of a conditioned or reward-related behavior? And these data are shown here. 
Befitting the need to achieve a loss of control, we use bilateral cannulas and fiber optics delivered to the bilateral accumbens uh, and delivered yellow light. And uh, we used two sets of animals. Over three, three cohorts of each, we used two sets of animals. One are uh, represented, uh, both, actually both are represented here. Here is effectively a control animal. These are Cree negative. They're litter mates. Everything was done identically to them in terms of surgery, light, pulses, everything. Uh, but they should not be expressing uh, the uh, uh, inhibitor, the NPHR 3.0. They're Cree recombinase negative. And here's the pattern you see upon testing. The animal prefers to spend time in the chamber where it received uh, cocaine. However, the animals that are Cree positive that are expressing NPHR in the cholinergic cells do not show uh, the emergence of this preference for the chamber where they receive cocaine. And these data are summarized here. A host of control experiments show there was not a, a nonspecific effect on anxiety. You can kind of pick up that here. There's no obvious effect in uh, center versus surround uh, behavior, uh, which is a sensitive test for anxiety-related behaviors in rodents uh, or other measures. And there was no effect on, uh, in the absence of, uh, of cocaine on chamber uh, preference. So the, this is, the, the cholinergic cells in the Cummins have been hypothesized, although with, uh, not uh, really the ability to test it to constitute uh, uh, craving cells. Uh, there's a lot of interest in understanding what their causal role is. Uh, and so this uh, uh, provides a, a step in that direction, showing that they're causally involved in the emergence of uh, 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 cocaine conditioning. Now, that's in mice. There's an incredible diversity of Cree driver mice that's growing and will allow a huge number of experiments to be done. But some things you need other animals for. And you can't do everything in mice. We're now building Cree driver rats. And we've now made successfully tyrosine hydroxylase Cree driver rats that you could use to drive dopamine or norepinephrine. We've made chat Cree rats. Uh, an image from those are shown here, good specificity. And so now we can achieve these uh, 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 combinatorial control and independent control of different neuromodulator systems uh, in different circuits uh, using uh, uh, rats as well. In the last couple of minutes, I'll just touch on a, a, one other way to achieve specificity. I've talked about projection targeting. Clearly, this uh, requires no genetic knowledge at all. You just need to know the anatomy. We saw this in the fMRI experiment. Uh, enhanced trafficking of the opsins really enables this. Uh, for example, the NPHR 3.1 traffics very well down axons in vivo. And in, in some older work, uh, we showed that actually this uh, projection targeting concept could allow you to uh, understand aspects of how deep brain stimulation work. In this experiment, we went into the subthalamic nucleus, a common deep brain stimulation target, and we asked what patterns of excitation or inhibition of different cellular elements might be able to mimic the effect of deep brain stimulation in Parkinsonian animals. And I'll spend one minute uh, uh, refreshing uh, 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 memories on that. What we did was, for example, this experiment driving the inhibitor under control of the chemokinase 2 alpha promoter, so turning off excitatory cells. We went into the subthalamic nucleus, asked what happens to this rotational behavior that you see in the hemi-Parkinsonian animals. This is a pathological behavior. There's a weak effect, weak therapeutic effect of inhibiting the excitatory cells, uh, but it's, it's not a strong effect. Much more potent effect was an experiment where the only photosensitive element was, was axons in the subthalamic nucleus, where it was projections to the subthalamic nucleus that were photosensitive. There we saw a robust and reversible inhibition of the Parkinsonian type uh, phenotype, suggesting that for a point source like an electrode or an optical fiber, uh, the most effective kind of uh, stimulation might be one that uh, recruits the uh, axons, the tracks coming into a structure, uh, particularly for an odd-shaped structure like the STN. This was interesting. It was a uh, frequency-specific. If you did a 100 hertz high frequency type stimulation, you saw the therapeutic effect. If you did a pathological type oscillation, a beta band or 20 hertz low frequency stimulation, you actually saw indeed a pathological effect that was reversible. And the crossover between the two was at 70 hertz, which is exactly what's seen uh, clinically. And uh, here is showing the reversible bradykinesia of these animals with optical control of the afferent fibers coming into the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, Brady kinetic behavior observed before, uh, but not during, and then after the delivery of the high frequency optogenetic stimulation. So, uh, in, in summary, uh, a number of 
targeting modalities make this approach uh, generalizable. Uh, the Cree dependent and associated viral vectors allow one to capitalize on uh, all the mouse lines and an emerging uh, set of rat lines. And the projection targeting approach allows you uh, to do things in a completely genetic information independent fashion. Of course, you can multiplex the two. You can add in genetic information when you have it. And so uh, at this point, one can do uh, uh, relevant experiments in, in essentially every, every circuit or tissue of, of choice. And so now, uh, uh, more than 800 labs are now doing these experiments. Thousands of researchers we've sent clones to uh, working in a host of different uh, uh, organisms also now uh, emerging into non-neuroscience applications, stem cells, heart cells, and, and non-excitable cells, using these concepts and the uh, diversity of, of uh, different kinds of opsins and different kinds of effector function. And examples of that are shown here. First targeting a non-neural cell type glial cells, uh, our colleague uh, has recently shown that you can uh, recruit uh, neurons that are involved in breathing by exciting glia by driving channel rhodopsin 2 function in GFAP uh, positive cells. And a little calcium comes in through the channel rhodopsin pore. This triggers calcium waves in the glia and then allows them to modulate nearby neurons uh, by virtue of released uh, uh, purinergic receptor modulators. Cardiac function has recently been, been shown, uh, delivering NPHR to the developing zebrafish myocardium where you can optically uh, control uh, myocardium function at different steps in development and study the role of activity in the evolution uh, and development of this, uh, of this organ. And uh, several recent papers have delivered channel rhodopsin to embryonic, both human and mouse embryonic stem cells to study the role of activity in proliferation, differentiation, survival, and phenotype consolidation. For a lot of uh, these people, uh, particularly from other fields, the technique is a little daunting at first, but we've been working to try to help uh, uh, train people. We run little uh, courselets, and people from all walks of life come to, to, to these courses. You can see uh, Ann Grabiel here from MIT, so she was there side by side with her uh, students and postdocs. And so it was a lot, of, uh, a lot of fun. People spend two or three days in the lab and, and go back to their home institutions uh, ready to go. Uh, so that's it. Uh, as you can see, a number of different domains required after those initial uh, uh, experiments to make things uh, 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 really work well with high fidelity and, and, and versatile fashion. And as last slide, I, I always like to point out that uh, these tools coming from, uh, in many cases, rare and fragile ecological niches, it's a, it's a good case study for the uh, both supporting basic research but also preserving uh, ecological diversity. It would be hard to predict that this salt lake would help us uh, understand aspects of Parkinson's, for example. So that's it. Uh, I want to thank uh, many, many outstanding colleagues uh, over the years. Uh, Peter Hageman on, on VCHR1 and, and some of the molecular engineering tools. Uh, Gerg Nagel on CHR2, Alexander Gottschalk on NPHR. Uh, uh, many other colleagues uh, summarized here. Um, and then uh, students and postdocs uh, uh, along uh, this axis, you can see uh, Feng Zhang here, who's just started his lab at MIT, assistant professor, did most of that work. He joins two other uh, trainees of mine at MIT, uh, Ed Boyden and Polina Anikeva. So uh, I'm, I'm settling MIT uh, single-handedly. Um, but not everyone's going to MIT. Vikas Hall, who did the Parvalgumin work, he went to uh, uh, UCSF. Uh, Jin Lee, uh, who worked on the OFMRI work, uh, is uh, at UCLA, and uh, uh, other people who you'll hear about soon. So uh, that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. Yeah. The question is, do we have a retrograde transporter? Uh, this is uh, sort of a holy grail. Uh, the idea being, can you label a cell for control um, uh, transsynaptically? Um, uh, and this is uh, something which many people have, have tried uh, over the years. Uh, a lot of things sort of work. Uh, nothing yet works extremely well. And the things that sort of work, the herpes-based uh, uh, infections of axon terminals work, and so you can kind of do it that way. Uh, pseudotype lentiviruses, rabies pseudotype lentiviruses work. 
Uh, some serotypes of AAV also work. Uh, some transsynaptic transporters, wheat germ and glutenin, uh, a tetanus toxin work. Um, uh, none of them work uh, spectacularly well. They all, they, they work, some of them work very well in some systems, but not others, and so I, there's not quite a, a, a cookbooky uh, pull it off the shelf and make it work thing. But we're working hard on that. We, we actually have some, some promising results with a modified uh, herpes strategy, which uh, hopefully we'll be sharing soon. How long can you inhibit? Yeah. yeah. Um, I might even have uh, some data on how long you can achieve inhibition. So the uh, advantage of the uh, the stable uh, uh, NPHR 3.0 is you actually can get extremely long uh, time scale inhibition over many minutes that are suitable for. Uh, okay, here you go. Here is a, a cell expressing NPHR 3.0. You can see scale bar here a minute. And so, you know, 10, 15 minutes, plenty of time for a behavioral experiment. And this is indeed what we use for the behavioral experiments. There's a little bit of a peak in a steady state, uh, but even that little peak uh, recovers uh, on a time scale of 20 seconds or so. Um, so yeah, you can be tens of minutes for sure. I don't know if you want to go longer. Okay. More questions? Okay, I have one. Can we think in the future like stroke recovery through channel reduction? How toxic is the substance? Hmm. Uh, so clinical applications in general. Um, so it's you know it, it doesn't look toxic. Uh, you know we've made mice that you know live normal lifespans. They breed. They express it throughout their brains. Uh, um, you know, uh, that's no guarantee that it would not be toxic in, in human, and it doesn't quite address the issue of immune, uh, you know, uh, problems. Uh, if you introduce a, a protein that the animal hasn't grown up with, it may be viewed as foreign and, and trigger uh, an immune response. I, uh, I'm not really working or pushing uh, or trying to achieve a direct clinical translation. I'm not trying to put these into people. I think uh, if, if a niche is found for that, it, its significance will be dwarfed just by the, the basic science understanding that we get from animal models. And so I'm, I put 100% of my effort into just uh, the basic science. Uh, that said, it probably will uh, find some niche, uh, and, and I suspect even if, worst case, there is an immune response issue that that can be controlled with immunosuppressants, which we do anyway in many indications. Uh, so uh, there's no fundamental barrier, no, no, no technical barrier. Okay, thank you. So we're going to have now a general discussion. Uh, all the speaker will go there, and I guess David will start. And do you want to come up? Yes. Um, just before the discussion begins, I'm going to hand the moderation of the discussion over to uh, Mickey Goldberg. But I did want to thank again the speakers, all the speakers, for their very remarkable talks. I don't think I've ever spent a day in this room, or in fact, a day in this university at which I've been for 27 years, which has seemed to me so productive, so full of invention, such remarkable creativity, and such prospects. So. So um, I'm moved and very grateful and I think the fact that we have an audience here at 7 o'clock still for a conference be that began at quarter to nine is a tribute to the speakers and I might add a tribute to yourselves and your tenacity. I'm immensely grateful you've, you've um, uh, added a great deal of distinction to the events which we hold here at the Academy and as a small reward my staff will kill me for this but, as a, but they can't kill me for this because I make a a small reward in a Christmas spirit and invite you all to our Christmas party which is known for its festivity next Wednesday the 8th um, of December. Is it the 8th? Help, where's my staff? Next Wednesday the 8th of... Is it the 8th? 
they've all disappeared. The 8th of December, um, here at the Academy from 5.30 to 7.30, it usually goes on a bit later. So please come. Um, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. There will be a, a small reception outside for you to continue your discussions, but I now want to call on my... Oh, I want to say one thing about Franco. Franco is the sort of spiritus rector, Franco, um, of this... Um, event today. It was he who thought of most of the names. I think I take credit for one and one or two, but he really thought of most of the names along with Mickey. And he has actually been quite um, self-sacrificing because I know that he prepared ten minutes of commentary himself, which we would have loved to have heard from him. He was a distinguished fellow here and he always kept everyone at our interdisciplinary seminars very much in line. I'm sure even in such formidable company he would have kept you all in line yourselves. He's really announce that pleasure and we're going to hand it over to Mickey. Thank you for coming, thank you for being here. Mickey, the floor is yours. So I, I think this is more of a Wagnerian than an Italian opera day. But um, does anyone in the audience have a question for any of the wonderful speakers this afternoon? Yes. Immune responses, though, take uh, longer uh, to develop than, than, than over the time scale that we've looked. You know, we typically assay them within one or two months. Uh, sometimes these can take uh, uh, many months to develop in people. Obviously, the brain is somewhat immune privileged, uh, uh, and uh, the viruses, the AAVs, are not particularly immunogenic. So uh, a number of, of factors contribute. Uh, it is an interesting question, and so I, I would say one could be cautiously optimistic uh, that they would not be particularly immunogenic in people either, although it remains to be seen. Uh, but again, not, uh, not the primary uh, objective of the work. So I guess this, this for uh, theory, I was really uh, blown away. <coughs> predict the future, but I, I will say that I'm using this stimuli to understand basic uh, scientific questions. We're not really interested in understanding the artistic part of, of, of movies or why movies are so effective. I think the, the two line of research that's going on, one is the communication. I think that looking on two brain interaction and really looking on how these third responses connect all of us together and how we interact. I think this is one of the main things. Another thing, there is a line of research that I didn't present almost at all. This is we're looking on the time scale of processing. I think while you're moving to natural stimuli, you bring new questions to the field. It's not that you're replicating what everyone are doing with control Gabor patches, but only with natural stimuli. It's really bring new questions. And one of them is how we process information over long time scales, for example, this symposium was for the entire day and you still remember the first talk and you can use this information to act now, so that's another line of research. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. I was thrilled to see you identify PITD as a the best candidate yet for an area of controlling attention. I have to wonder, there were all these functional imaging studies that searched in humans for just this thing. And 
from your neurons, it looked like it should have just stood out like a beacon. I wonder if you have any idea of why it wasn't spotted. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I don't know if it has been spotted, I think part of the, in, in the human brain at least, um, because we don't know the homology very well. So I was making this point that we use the same technology comparing across species. Um, one factor uh, slowing this down are simple things like receptive field sizes. So I could show to you a 10 left versus a 10 right. So we were in the same task as human subjects, so it was like some, some candidate area, but it's not as clear, and I think it's because receptive fields are larger, and therefore this contrast left versus right, you don't get such a big difference. In, human subjects. So to, to think of something different, however, there are now mapping studies that identified something PITD like in humans uh, last year, how could Colster has done this. Um, so we can revisit this question uh, this way. Um, yeah, and this was the first time we tried it in the monkeys, so I think this is why we hadn't had it in monkeys before. Um, we, we've actually started to look at some memory uh, uh, questions, um, sort of re-exploring uh, some of the older lesion work, um, really just capitalizing to begin with on the temporal precision of the causal intervention to see if you see something different when, when you've turned off a, a region uh, with millisecond precision as opposed to days, or even the sort of 30 minutes that you get pharmacologically, do you see something different? How fast is the adaptation? Uh, that's present, and uh, could we have been sort of uh, could could the uh, the lesion or, or, or pharmacological work uh, maybe not have the full story? So we are exploring that, uh, uh, um, but there are challenges. Um, for example, um, and maybe this is this is what you're getting at. If a memory, the memory itself is is quite sparsely, let's say, represented, uh, and and cells may need to be. Uh, uh, um, control that correspond to a particular memory uh, in, in a, a quite sparse fashion, it would be difficult to causally drive a particularly uh, a widely distributed sparse pattern of neurons uh, um, without knowing in advance what they were, how they, if, if they were the ones that corresponded to the memory trace or not. So you could generally ramp up a brain structure or ramp up a projection or ramp up a population of cells, but playing in the memory, if, if a memory is indeed a particular pattern of activity of a sparsely distributed population of cells, it's going to be hard to, to, to really causally uh, 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 deliver that activity to a defined population. Yes, so uh, we've thought a lot about that. You could, in principle, you could, for example, you have a strong memory like a fear memory, put channel rhodopsin 2 under control of a ARC or CFOS promoter, uh, and then turn it on only in those cells that were turned on by the conditioning process, for example. And that's a great idea. It kind of works, uh, but the, um, the the leak becomes a real problem here. A lot of these promoters uh, are, are somewhat leaky and will deliver a little bit of uh, opsin expression, even in the absence of, 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 of drive by the behavioral stimulus. And uh, so it becomes kind of technically challenging. Uh, we are working on it, though. Is it involved activating enough of the cells that you originally stored the trace? I think it's more a problem of, of having the delta of opsin expression be great enough because there's the leak of the promoter. It's not so much activating the number of cells. I think we can do that. It's more for those cells what the delta in light sensitivity will be. Where, 
Yeah, uh, so it's a fairly technical question. Um, uh, in general, what we've found is that uh, choice of linear classifier, as long as it's like a decent one, like linear discriminant analysis, support vector machines, if the data are, are generally multivariate Gaussian, you're okay. And so it, 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 it's, it doesn't wind up being a huge deal. Um, an another issue is dimensionality. So we're, there are many voxels in the brain, so you have many features when you do this classification process. And with fMRI data, you, you know, we don't keep our subject in there for multiple days with a bedpan and an IV. And so uh, you only get so many samples. Um, so you need to reduce the dimensionality. Support vector machine kind of does it through focusing on the, the support vectors or, or you could reduce dimensionality in other ways. In the end, I feel like the, the biggest factors that affect the quality of the data we can get are our experimental paradigm, the quality of the subjects that they're just really super attentive and don't move and are willing to lie in the scanner for two and a half, three hours uh, on a bite bar, and, um, and just thinking carefully about the questions uh, and, and the analysis. Uh, I don't think it will boil down to which linear classifier pick. I mean, there, there are ways you could improve things, and we, we found ways, and we thought about, should we spend the time to write a paper on this? We boosted our decoding by 5%. But in the end, that's not really what we're, we're out to try to do. Um, it, it's more, is there information, and if we can get a good enough signal, how well can we leverage it to understand a cognitive question? So it's 7 o'clock, and I think it's appropriate to put the last words Gloria to David, to Franco, and to the content volume on staff and also the other speakers.